All right, so we are coming to the end of this series uh, for Advent. So Advent comprises the four Sundays that lead up to Christmas. Um, like Tyler mentioned earlier, Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which means coming. So it's a time of the year that we focus on and we ponder the significance of the first coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago. And so during these four Sundays, we've been looking at uh, one of the books in the New Testament. It has four chapters. It's the book of Philippians. So it was a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to the church in Philippi. He's the one who started this church when he and Silas went there, preached the gospel, and people became Christians and formed a church. So the gospel is the reason for Jesus coming into the world. Gospel means good news. So the announcement, if you remember, if you're familiar with the Christmas story, the announcement that the angel made on the night of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem from Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So the gospel is why Jesus came. The gospel is also why Paul went to Philippi in the first place. Again, it means good news. And here's just a brief summary of that good news. God made everything, and he made everything good. But our first parents, Adam and Eve, were tempted by Satan, by the evil one, to distrust God's goodness, like God's holding out on you. You mean he said you can't eat from this tree? Maximizing the restriction, minimizing the freedom. And because they bought that lie, by their rebellion, they plunged the human race and the world into darkness and trouble. So we all know that the world's broken. I don't think I need to convince anybody of that, that all is not right, all is not well. And we even know that that's true in here right, of ourselves. We don't even keep our own standards, let alone God's, and we're filled with guilt and regret. So if there's no God, and we're all just a cosmic accident, why in the world is our sense so strong that all is not right with the world, that something's gone wrong? Wouldn't that be really strange? Even if it's not strange, it's meaningless, ultimately. Because what is it? What is that sense of it being wrong? That things aren't as they ought to be. It's just the swishing about of fluids in your brain. All we are and experience is just time and chance and random mutations. But if there is a God, there is a God. <laughs> he made all things good. And the reason why things are bad is because of the badness within us and others. That's why we can't shake the conviction that this is not the way it's supposed to be. And we just can't, we just flat out can't fix it on our own. We can't atone for our sins. We can't do enough good deeds to make up for our bad. We can't climb a ladder to, to the sky to present ourselves worthy. I mean, lots of people try, but God is holy. He's righteous. He's not a great on the curve, you know, grandpa in the sky. But he's also not Zeus. He doesn't have a hair trigger on his lightning bolt launcher. When we encounter the, the God of the Bible, over and over again, we see that he is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So we are totally bankrupt. We're in spiritual debt in over our heads. We're guilty before the judge of all the earth. He knows it all, every thought, every word. Can't hide it. Nobody's getting away with anything. And we deserve judgment and condemnation. We are all slaves of false gods. We bow down to idols of sex and money and the approval of others and on and on. We're not good at freeing ourselves from our slavery from our addictions, we usually just replace one drug of choice with another. And that's exactly why Jesus came, the first advent, 
He came to save us from our sins. He came to free us from our slavery. And he did it by becoming a slave. Dying like a slave in order that we could be set free. Philippians 2.5, so this is the same book, but chapter 2, Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, didn't he, didn't he count equality with God, so he's equal with God, but he did not consider that equality something to be held on to, maintained for his own comfort and advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which was the ultimate humiliation. So rather than sending us all to hell, because of God's great love, Jesus went through hell and paid the hell that people like you and me deserve on the cross. So the gospel is the good news of Jesus for bad people like you and me. people that realize that we need a Savior, that we've got to stop running away from Jesus. That's like repentance. You turn away from that and you run to Jesus in faith because He can save us and we accept this free gift of forgiveness and cleansing and new life that we find in Him. And that grace then changes us makes us new people. It makes us more like Jesus. Certainly with fits and starts, nobody's perfect even after they become a Christian. But we start to live a life that reflects how precious Jesus is, how powerful the gospel is. And so the main theme of this book of Philippians is actually found back in chapter 1, verse 27, where Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of Reflect the worth of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you, because he's in prison at this point when he writes this letter, or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We're all little reflectors giving off the light of what we love. Whatever our lives are set on, like the moon to the sun, we give off the light of what we love. So what is your life set on? If someone spends time with you, it doesn't take long before they learn what is most precious, most valuable to you. What's the great treasure of your life? What's the pearl of great price for you? Well, the only treasure that's great enough that will ever satisfy us. The only true pearl of great price. The only true sun around which our lives are meant to orbit is Jesus. And chapter 4 of Philippians helps us see what it looks like to live lives that radiate the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So we're going to look at that chapter, most of it, more, more so the front half of the chapter this morning. The latter half is, is kind of Paul saying thank you to the Philippians for how they supported him um, in his ministry. So, the outline will be up on the screens. It's also on the um, live stream page there if you want to follow along that way on the notes. So first point, all things in the Lord, verses 1 to 4. So we're going to see three things in the Lord in these four verses. We're going to see that we need to stand firm in the Lord, that we need to agree in the Lord, and that we need to rejoice in the Lord. So first off, stand firm in the Lord, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So once again, we saw this in chapter 1. We've seen it elsewhere in the book. Paul's deep affection for his spiritual family in Philippi. Not biological family, but their family because of the blood of Jesus Okay, they're his spiritual siblings, his brothers and sisters, his family. He loves them. He longs to be with them. He wants to see them again. They are his joy and crown. So Paul doesn't aspire to the corner office or wealth and privilege. The crown of his life is more and more people who've been changed and transformed by the power of the gospel that have that hope, that living hope, 
that know the love of Jesus and all of a sudden they are now secure in who they are because they are loved by God and adopted into his family as beloved sons and daughters. People who live for and love like Jesus. That's what he lives for. They are his crown and joy. So as he draws this letter to a close, he exhorts them, therefore, stand firm thus. Okay, this language of standing firm echoes that main exhortation, right? Chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I might hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. So he's also, when he says, therefore, stand firm, he's referring back to what he wrote in chapter 3. We looked at it last week. So in chapter 3, Paul's learned that he can put no confidence in his own resume, his own achievements. His confidence can only be in Christ, his Savior. Everything else is ultimately worthless compared to knowing Christ. So he presses on to know Christ more and to follow him on the path of love. Not living for his own selfish interests, but living for the best interests of others, just like Jesus. That's the path of maturity. And pressing on, following hard after Jesus, is actually how you stand firm. So if you put the therefore together, you know, the, the stuff of chapter 3 together with chapter 4, pressing on is actually how you stand firm. You find stability and security by pursuing Jesus. But notice also in verse 1 the word thus. So the therefore look back, the thus looks forward. So this verse is like a hinge. It points forward to the content of chapter 4. What does it look like to stand firm? Well, stand firm thus. And then he's going to explain what that looks like in chapter 4. How do you stand firm? Well, here, read on. So before we read on, just don't miss the obvious here. God wants us to have stability. He's saying stand firm. He wants us to be able to stand firm, and he's going to tell us how. He doesn't leave us to just figure it out on our own. He tells us what it looks like, and he tells us how to do it. So the whole chapter is going to unpack what it looks like to stand firm. The first and most important way is to stand firm in the Lord. Okay, we don't stand firm in our own strength. We don't stand firm by some secret stoic breathing exercises and yoga routine, you know, that we do every morning. We stand firm in the Lord, in His strength, by His grace. And that's not the only thing that we must do in the Lord. Look at verse 2. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And then he asks this friend of his, this faithful companion of his, to help these women who've labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So Philippi's good, solid church. There's lots of things that Paul commends with them. But even there, unity's hard. And you know what? Unity's just hard, isn't it? <laughs> Real, substantial, lasting unity is hard. It's hard in marriage. It's hard in families. It's hard in churches. We don't always see eye to eye. <laughs> Sometimes through open and kind of reasonable dialogue, we can come to the same conclusion on a matter. Sometimes... We just come to the point where, you know, we just realize something isn't significant enough to make a big deal of it, and we can agree to disagree. Sometimes, we just don't agree, and the more we talk about it, the more galvanized we get in our differing positions, and we just have this impasse. I mean, what do we do then? Pretend like things don't exist, you know, the disagreement doesn't exist, and form this kind of fake superficial unity. We just start to withdraw from each other? No. This word agree, I entreat Yodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. It's actually the same word used back in chapter 2. Flip back to chapter 2. Verse 
It's literally having the same mind. So 2-2, two, two, Paul uses it there, complete my joy by being of the same mind, same word. And then it's used again in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves. Share the same mind, this Christ-like mind. So we may not agree on every secondary or third-level issue. I mean, certainly we need to agree on the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that, you know, we're only saved by grace through faith. I mean, we could go on and on. The things that we can't just agree to disagree on inside the church But on secondary, third-level issues, we can have the same humble, Christ-like mindset to love and serve and consider first the interests of others. So we can and we must approach and relate to one another in a gracious, benefit-of-the-doubt, understanding, and blood-bought unity sort of way with one another. So... We're still one in Christ, even if we disagree on these things. And so the way in which we disagree can still preserve that unity, right? We can agree in the Lord. We can agree on the most important things. And one day, because we're in the Lord, we're going to understand our differences with perfect clarity. <laughs> and we won't be at odds in anything forever, because we're all going to be perfectly one in Christ forever. When Jesus returns, sets everything to rights, and we're going to see things clearly and fully. So that's a pretty relevant word, right? In the midst of our contentious age, our, these contentious times. So do our differing perspectives on politics or economics or the coronavirus and masking and guidelines, does that mean we're just doomed to disunity? Like, for the rest of our days? No, God forbid. So you and another Christian may have had different beliefs about who to vote for and why and how to weigh what's right and wrong about this candidate or that candidate or about this platform or that platform. But what you ought to be able to agree on in the Lord are the things that have to do with the mind of Christ, right? So at the very least, truth matters and spin and propaganda damage societal stability and hurt people. For instance, again, just using the political thing as a, an example because obviously it's very relevant, that we should all be able to agree that all lives matter, black and white and blue and the unborn, that the care for the poor matters, even if we don't agree on how to most effectively carry it out, that concern for religious freedom matters whether here in the U.S. or in other countries where there are atrocious human rights violations being perpetrated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? A couple of texts from Romans 14 and 15. Listen to these again. So that we have the mind of Christ when it comes to disagreements, so that we can agree in the Lord. As for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. This is third-level issues where... Again, it's okay to disagree. Romans 14, 13, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. And then Romans 15, 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So certainly, unity can be hard to reach, hard to preserve, but it is worth working for, brothers and sisters. And sometimes... We actually need third-party help. Do you see what Paul did for Yodi and Syntyche? He said, you guys need some help. So true companion, whoever that was, they knew who it was. Would you please help these women? I mean, they're the real deal. All of them, their names are written in the book of life. Real deal, authentic Christians can just disagree to the point where they need some help. So do you need to pursue some third-party help on something? so that you can agree in the Lord with your brother or sister and not let that thing steal the unity that Jesus died to win. So, stand firm in the Lord, agree in the Lord, now rejoice in the Lord. Look at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. So just like unity is hard, 
deep, abiding, durable joy is hard, isn't it? And there's like all kinds of reasons for discouragement and even despair at times. Plenty that rise internally, you know, wake up in the morning, start spinning, and, you know, you're freaking out by the time you get out of the shower. There are plenty that come at us externally, circumstantially, on a daily basis. And sometimes, sometimes we don't even know why we're so discouraged. We can't even put a finger, finger on it. So is this just like a pipe dream? Like, come on, this is so unrealistic. Rejoice in the Lord is always? I mean, is it even insensitive of Paul or... Let's be honest, I mean, of God to expect this of us? I mean, is this some kind of super spirituality that's out of touch with the brokenness and pain of this fallen world, or at least in my life? I mean, maybe this is, you know, realistic for somebody else, but not for me. You don't know what I've been through or what I'm going through. No, this is not joy that is superficial or out of touch with the brokenness of our lives and our world. And it's certainly not incompatible with sorrow. Actually, two chapters earlier, Philippians 2, Paphroditus was the one that brought the help to Paul, and he almost died. And Paul says, the fact that God healed him and, you know, he recovered, spared me sorrow upon sorrow. And Paul's writing, rejoice in the Lord always. And he's rejoicing even though he's in prison. So those are not incompatible things. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 6.10, Paul describes himself and his fellow ministers as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. That's possible in the Lord. So really knowing how broken this world is, and we've got all kinds of reasons to weep and to be sorrowful, and yet none of those things can steal, ultimately, our joy in the Lord. So anybody can give thanks, rejoice in ease and abundance, but who in the world can give thanks and rejoice in the midst of trouble and lack? Well, Christians, because their joy is in Jesus. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and no one can take him from us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And when we have that kind of durable joy, do you see how it reflects on the worth of the gospel? We conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, and we show people how great Jesus is, how great it is, surpassing value of knowing Jesus as our Lord. So rejoice in the Lord always. We've got to learn to have joy in the journey, don't we? I mean, we're just spring-loaded to look around the next bend for joy. Starts early, you know? Like, what grade schooler doesn't, can't wait till summer. High schoolers can't wait till graduation. College students can't wait till the next break and to graduate. Singles can't wait to get married. Young couples can't wait to have kids. Couples with young kids can't wait until their kids are a little older and they're out of diapers and you can click yourself into the car seat and, you know, whatever. Parents with teenagers look wistfully back on the days when they were clicking car seats. Um, Single people wish they were married. Married people wishing they were single. Poor people wishing they were rich. Rich people wishing things weren't so complicated. Working people wishing they were retired. Retired people missing their work. And all of us wishing that this stupid pandemic was passed. But yes, I mean, okay, of course, of course, but we can actually rejoice in the Lord. Like, our joy is not around the vaccination bend. We can have joy in Jesus now. So at the end of the last battle, if you're familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, the last battle... Um, the last book in the series, Tyrion, who was the last king of Narnia, is welcomed into Narnia by some of the characters who have been central to the Chronicles and earlier parts of the story. And he's introduced to High King Peter, Lady Polly, Lord Diggory, King Edmund, and Tyrion realizes somebody's missing. So let me read a little section. Sire, he's speaking to High King Peter, said Tyrion when he had greeted all these. If I've read the Chronicles right, there should be another. Has not your majesty two sisters? Where is Queen Susan? My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. 
Yes, said Eustace, and whenever you've tried to get her to come and talk about Narnia or do anything about Narnia, she says, what wonderful memories you have. Fancy you're still thinking about all those funny games we used to play when we were children. Oh, Susan, said Jill. She's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She always was a jolly sight, too keen on being grown up. Grown up indeed, said Lady Polly. I wish she would grow up. She wasted all her school time wanting to be the age she is now, and she'll waste all the rest of her life trying to stay that age. Her whole idea is to race on to the silliest time of one's life as quick as she can and then stop there as long as she can. So we've got to not spend our life seeking the holy grail of joy around the next bend in our dream home or hobby or vocational success or promotion or leisure or entertainment or sport or even in our children or grandchildren, as good as all those things can be. None of them are reliable enough or big enough or long-lasting enough to enable you to rejoice in them always. They will disappoint you and break your heart. But the Lord never will. And obviously, when we rejoice in the Lord, we can take joy in those things in their proper place. Okay, so those are the three in the Lord's at the beginning. The next exhortation is a radical one. Are you ready? Verse 5. It's radical Christianity. Here it is. Reasonableness. Verse 5. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand or the Lord is near. Well, reasonableness, what does that mean? I mean, I, you know, you're kind of like, I know what that word means, sort of, but that's weird. Well, let's look at a couple other places where this word is used in the New Testament. It's usually translated differently. So in 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, an elder or spiritual leader in the church should not be a drunkard, but not violent, but gentle. Same word. Not quarrelsome. Titus 3.2. Titus is to remind the church there in Crete, that these folks should speak evil of no one to avoid quarreling. See, quarreling, not quarreling. To be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. So notice what's put together there. Not quarrelsome, show perfect courtesy, be gentle. I mean, somebody needs to tell the Christians on social media. Would somebody take care of that this afternoon? Um, James three seventeen, another place. But wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, Gentle, same word, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. So look at what attends, like, this virtue, what goes alongside this virtue, being peaceable, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, okay? But it's translated as gentle. So you could translate this, let your gentleness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. So to everyone means Christians and to everyone else alike. So one commentator explains it like this. In the context of ill treatment, because the Philippians were experiencing some suffering, some persecution, in the context of ill treatment, reasonableness signifies a humble, patient steadfastness which is able to submit to injustice, disgrace, and maltreatment without hatred or malice, trusting God in spite of it all. So there's this gentleness to your spirit. And then Paul says, the Lord is at hand. Other translations, the Lord is near. So how are we supposed to understand this? Is it in terms of, like, in spatial terms, like the Lord is close, proximity-wise, or temporal terms, terms, his return is near? Well, actually, unfortunately, that word is used in both senses in the New Testament. Sometimes in spatial terms, sometimes in temporal terms. So, you know, if it's spatial, then you have an idea like Psalm 34. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Isn't that encouraging? Or Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So if the temporal meaning is intended, then, or if the the spatial term is intended, then his nearness is encouraging us. Like, he's going to take care of us. He hasn't abandoned us. We don't have to be like survivors, you know, like, 
he, he's going to take care of us, and so we can be reasonable and gentle. The Lord will vindicate. We don't have to be vindictive. If it's his return is coming, again, it's still focused on his help. He's going to right every wrong. The meek shall inherit the earth. We don't have to take matters into our own hands. So, you know, both things are theologically true, right? The Lord's certainly not aloof. He's near and involved and attentive. And the Lord is coming again. No one knows the day or the hour, but we should live in light of his return. We should look forward to it, to seeing him face to face when he's going to just set everything to rights and renew all things. So maybe Paul could even have intended the ambiguity, ambiguity so as to prompt thoughts in both directions. But do you see how radical this is? I mean, I know I need radical root level change if this is going to characterize me with everyone. Anybody else? I mean, do you want this to characterize you? What if Christians in Wilmington were known to be the most reasonable, gentle, gracious people in the city? I don't think that's really the reputation for Christians in our country. And probably for good reason. But how about Wilmington? How about we say, Lord, so make us like Jesus that we would be known for our gentleness, our reasonableness. Ray Ortland wrote this recently, so encouraging, challenging. He says, Dear American Christians, Philippians 4, 5 is still there on the page of our Bibles. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Publicly obvious reasonableness, fair-mindedness, and restraint declare to our nation how real and present God is. I love this. Calm is our prophetic edge. Gentle, cheerful generosity of mind is the new Christian radicalism. <laughs> I'm signing up. I hope you will too. Let's treat the living God who is for us, and he's near, as more real than whatever might be against us. You see how radical this is? Gracious, benefit of the doubt, kind, overlooking offense, forgiving, magnanimous Christianity. People of goodwill, not petty and nitpicky, not resentful or bitter or vindictive. We don't want to be small-minded and faint-hearted. We don't want to be big-headed and cold-hearted. We want to be noble-minded and large-hearted. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm just totally convicted on this front. I mean, the other night, honest, like, weary of kind of bearing one more burden on account of the sin or mistakes of other people, you know. Yes, I'm getting self-righteous, you know, you can see it. And I'm getting angry and irritable and impatient, short with my family, and then, I, and I went in the bathroom, and I'm just like, I knew I was just not going in a good direction. And I just thought, <laughs> like, what's the problem? I don't want to have to deal with one more thing. that's all that God's ever had to deal with. <laughs> it's one more thing. It's, it's all our mess. And he's indefatigable. Like he's just, his mercies are new every morning. He's a, he's a self-replenishing supply. And he doesn't scold us and just like, you know, just sit back and go, you guys are pathetic. I'm so sick of dealing with you. I'm up to here. You know? The gentleness of Jesus the more cognizant we are of it, the more that it's just front and center. Oh my goodness, what do I deserve? Will <sighs> fill us with grace and enable us to be reasonable, gentle. So let's fix our eyes on our gentle Savior that he might make us more like him. Now, you might be thinking, holy cow, we're going to be here till like 1245. No, the last four points are going to be pretty quick. They're going to show us that we need to trust Jesus with all the things, all the things of life. So pray about these things, think about these things, practice these things, and be content with or without the things. That's where we'll go, and we'll cover this pretty quickly. So just as a heading over all this, we've seen from the beginning of this series as we look at the book of Philippians, 
that Jesus is Lord over all of life. Okay, real deal, authentic Christianity is not just Jesus as a garnish. No veneer nominal Christianity, okay? I mean, if Jesus isn't Lord of Lords, then just don't bother at all. But if he is, if he is the sun in the solar system of our lives, then he cares about and his lordship extends to all the things in our lives. And so first he wants us to pray about these things. Look at verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All the things. Don't be anxious about anything. In everything, all the things. Pray about these things. We spin and we fret about all the what ifs. And yes, we need to plan. We need to, you know, be ready for this, that, and the other thing. But so much of our what ifs are sinful anxiety. But what if goes the other way? When we pray, when we get oriented to what's true, what if we have a God and a Father who knows what we need and He's going to provide for us? He's for us and not against us. There's nothing, nothing that can separate us from His love. There are so many good news gospel what ifs that are greater than all of our circumstantial what ifs. So how many burdens do we carry that he wants to carry for us, that he wants us to cast them onto his infinitely broad shoulders? And in, in their place, he wants to give us peace that passes understanding to guard our minds and our hearts from spinning and fretting and so pray about these things. Also think about these things. Verse 8, point number 4. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What we think about has a massive impact on our attitude, on what we say, on how we feel on how we act. So where are our minds? What are we thinking about? Where does your mind go when it's in neutral? What are you filling your mind with? Think about these things. And that's obviously easy. First and foremost is go to the Word and fill your mind with what's true. Pray about these things. Think about these things. Now practice these things. Verse 9, uh, point number 5. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul's their spiritual father. And they can follow him as he follows Christ. Practice these same things, and the God of peace will be with you. So discipleship t takes practice. And following the right examples is vital. So practice these things. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on those who follow faithfully in mature ways so that you can learn what it looks like to be a faithful disciple and practice those things. And the God of peace will be with you. Do you notice how cool this like, bookend is in verse 9 to verses 6 and 7? Verses 6 and 7 say, Pray about these things and the peace of God will guard you. Verse 9 says, Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Don't you want the peace of God protecting you and the God of peace with you? <laughs> Finally, contentment in all things. Verses 10 to 13. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So, you and me, we're, we're pretty skillful. Pretty skillful and discontent, aren't we? Like master's level, maybe even PhD level, you know? We might more honestly, naturally say, I've learned in whatever situation to be discontent. Like that comes pretty easily. 
So we need this to learn the secret of being content with or without the things. So a guy named Eric Raymond, who's a pastor up in New England, I think, um, has written extensively on Christian contentment. So a couple quotes from him. God has never promised an easy path. He doesn't promise financial wealth, lots of friends, physical beauty or strength or professional success, but he does promise to be with his people, look after them, and when they close their eyes in death, to bring them to glory. And then he gets practical. Here's two helpful pieces of advice that he gives. First, I remind myself regularly not to interpret God's character in light of my circumstances, but instead to interpret my circumstances in light of God's character. I think that's probably worth reading again. We need to remind ourselves regularly not to interpret God's character in light of my circumstances, our circumstances, but instead to interpret my circumstances in light of God's character. And then, again, really practical, helpful way to learn the secret of contentment here, to be content with or without the things. It's a third quote from him. If you are having a hard time being content, Make a list of everything you have that you don't deserve. And then make a list of everything you deserve that you don't have. So we know it, but do we really know it? That contentment doesn't come from a little more. It doesn't come from outside circumstances. Because you know what? We can have it all and be discontent. Contentment comes from the inside as our hearts internalize the grace of God and it is real to us. That's when we learn the secret of contentment because we know that Jesus our Lord can strengthen us to do, to go through, to manage life with little or much. We can do all things through him who gives us strength. Oh, and by the way, is anyone anxious about facing plenty? Some of you might be wishing you could be anxious about that. Look at what Paul says. He's learned the secret of facing plenty. Learn the secret of facing abundance. You need the same secret for that situation, too. Abundance can be dangerous for contentment. Now, Let's wrap this up. You could view these exhortations, there's a lot of them here in chapter 4, right? As almost like impossible standards, like, good grief, I've got like a list as long as my arm, all I gotta do this week now. All the stuff I gotta change, all I gotta, uh, you know, like, thanks for the encouragement. Leave church with like, you know, 60 pound weight on your shoulders. Heavy yoke of expectation. Stand firm in the Lord, agree in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord always. Always be reasonable. <laughs> Always be gentle. Don't be anxious about anything. Think about the right things, not the wrong things. Practice what we learn from Christ-like leaders. Always be content in every circumstance. So you could view those exhortations as a heavy yoke of expectation. Or you could realize that just as Jesus came to seek and save lost and helpless sinners like you and me, first advent, and then as he came into our lives to make us his own, he's still seeking us to strengthen us and protect and encourage and shape us into his image. He is not asking us to screw this all up from within on our own. He is not asking us to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And even though that kind of means like get her done, you know, in our day and age. Originally, that expression is, it means the impossible. Of course, you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So that's what I mean it. I mean it in that original sense. Instead, this is our Lord who says, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke on you and learn from me because I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why is it easy and light? Because he bore our greatest burden for us on the cross. We don't have to bear the guilt and weight and punishment of our sins. He took it. He bore it for us. And then he bears our burdens with us all through this life. He bore it for us, our sins. He bears our burdens with us all through this life. He doesn't leave us to plow the field of our lives alone. He actually does the heavy lifting. He's not just a savior, and I don't say that that way to minimize his savior work, but he is also a helper and keeper and friend and refuge and source of strength and encouragement and joy and life and peace. He says, you are in me. You're in Christ. You're in the Lord. That's who you are. Now abide in me, and you will have what you need. Your love will abound. You will have resources to be gentle and experience my peace. You will be content in your circumstances. Your joy will be full. You'll be able to stand firm and press on. The secret of all of that is doing it all in the Lord. So we're going to close by singing, O come all ye faithful. Okay? So you know the words of that familiar hymn. The musicians can come on up here. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. So, yes, now as Christians, though not perfect, we can come with joy. We can come as more than, a, more than conquerors. We can even be faithful because of his grace, but just remember that we all first came as faithless. <laughs> the gospel is, O come all ye faithless, sad and weak, defeated. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem, come and behold him, born the friend of sinners. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And then because of our faithful Savior and by his grace, we can become faithful followers of Jesus that reflect, radiate the worth of the gospel of knowing Christ Jesus as our Savior and Lord. Let's sing.